Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Welcome to Palm Beach Chapel. I know you're here for the food today, so. I'm not missing much. I got a couple to read today. They're short, but when I used to hear things about people, you know, when you're getting old, well, they didn't relate too much. Now they're relating a little bit better. You know when you're old, when you're asleep, but others worry that you're dead. Your back goes out more than you do. You no longer laugh at Preparation H commercials. The only reason you're awake at 4 a.m. is indigestion. The pharmacy gives you a volume discount. You are proud of your lawnmower. That's me. 8 a.m. is your idea of sleeping in. And people call you at 8 p.m. and ask, did I wake you? <laughs> Words of wisdom. God never said that the journey would be easy, but he said that the arrival would be worthwhile. Max Lucado. Chris? together say the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever.
possível. Many a times we hear stories we say, that doesn't sound right. And it winds up to be absolutely correct. But it's that things through tradition got messed up. Well, that's the nativity. It's all messed up. So what I'm going to do is cover today an intro and the next two weeks up to what actually took place. You'd be surprised how many things aren't what they appear to be. Larry King, the CNN talk host, once asked who he would most want to interview if he chose anyone from all of history. He said, Jesus Christ. The questioner said, and what would you like to ask him? King replied, I would like to ask him if he was indeed virgin born. The answer to that question would define history for me. Critics' choice claim number one, the idea of virgin birth is scientifically impossible. Let's see how accurate that is, really. Where have these critics been for 44 years? On July 25th, 1978, Louise Joy Brown, the world's first baby to be conceived by way of vitro and fertilization, is born in Oldham and District General Hospital, Manchester, England, to parents Leslie and Peter Brown. Ever since, in vitro fertilization, an embryonic transfer came on the scene in 1978, not to mention artificial insemination. It is quite possible for a woman who has never experienced sexual intercourse to give birth. Of course, the Bible makes it clear that it was always God, not some high-paid gynecologist who worked the details. <laughs> When we think about what was said at that time, for many, many years, thought it's impossible. Now we see medicine can do it at the drop of a dime. We've advanced so much. Could we not think the creator of the universe was possibly able to do this? And the angel answered and said unto Mary, the Holy Spirit shall come upon you and the power of the highest shall overshadow you. For that reason, the holy child which shall be born of you shall be called the Son of God. Luke 1, 35. We experience the story of Jesus' birth in a variety of ways throughout the Christmas season. The story is presented through nativity scenes, TV shows, storybooks, paintings, and Christmas pageants. In fact, we encounter the Christmas story so often we're convinced we know all the details about what happened that night. But many of the things that we think we know about in the Christmas story are incorrect or tradition. Here are just five, just five. There's many more, but I'm only going to cover five. There was a star the night Jesus was born. Incorrect. There were three wise men or three kings of the Orient. Incorrect. There was no room for them at the inn. Incorrect. Jesus was born in a barn or stable. Incorrect. Jesus was born on December 25th. Incorrect. There are many, many more incorrect statements that we live by. We think it's all part of the process. And we think to ourselves, if these kind of things can get so distorted, and I'll cover them in the next two weeks exactly what took place and how it took place, you'll say to yourself, on other key issues that are mentioned in the Bible, how come there's mistakes? It's very simple. The Christmas story. Most of us have been brought up with the traditional Christmas story. You know, the one about being Jesus being born on Christmas Day in a stable in Bethlehem with the shepherds and the three <clears throat> kings of the Orient looking on depicting in countless major scenes. Uh, ours here is depicting that mistake. We're not going to change it, and it doesn't hurt anybody, but you should know the truth. So we'll cover the truth this year, clearly. 
While the gospel accounts of Matthew and Luke describe the true story of Jesus' birth, we'll see, they assuredly do not describe this Christmas story as it is popular this year or any year. How do we read it from the accounts and get it so wrong? The real Christmas story, these five misconceptions remind us that sometimes our picture of scriptural stories is shaped by more popular perceptions and more modern retellings than by the text itself. But when we take a closer look at the biblical clues, a wonderful and hopefully more accurate picture will emerge of what happened approximately 2,000 years ago. And what happened that night still stands as one of the most monumental events in history. God became man and entered our dark, cold world to redeem a sinful people. When we disturb the truth, when we don't teach the truth and it starts to get a little bit lost, the lost gets greater and greater and greater until we begin to miss what it's really all about. The reason Christ came here. What was the purpose for him to come? And if so many people know the Christmas story as it's depicted in so many different ways, why is it that they don't know why he came or don't even accept it when they do know? That's the story that makes Christmas worthy of being merry. This week we'll take a look at one of the authors of that story, Luke. Luke's important background Consider first Luke, the gospel writer, who had detailed mind of a physician and a historian. Very accurate in the way he would think. He took information and properly placed it down so that things wouldn't be distorted. Now keep in mind, he was guided by the Holy Spirit, so there was no mistakes made. He wanted to make sure he presented all the pertinent facts. Have you ever 30 thought it curious that although two of the Christmas Gospel writers describe the circumstance surrounding Christ's birth, the other two don't even cover the account? Two out of the four Gospel writers cover it, two don't. Neither of them gives the date. Has it puzzled you that the Bible never once mentions Christmas? You wouldn't think so, the way we know Christmas to be. And that none of the Bible writers say anything about commemorating that birth as completely monumental as it is. Most people, when they think of the Christmas story, think of one biblical narrative that includes the Holy Family, the midnight hour, a barn, various farm animals, shepherds, angels, wise men, and a quiet little town called Bethlehem. It might come as a big surprise to learn that many of the elements people often treasure as part of the nativity story come from Christmas carols. And that the true source of this event, the Gospels in the New Testament deal with the story of the birth of Jesus in four very different but yet not contradictory ways. And it's hard to believe that we have the Bible and we should know the truth, but the Christmas carols have distorted it more than anything else. It all sounds wonderful. We sing these stories and they sound wonderful, but they're not at all really accurate. That's what we're claiming about our history in this country today. No, you got it all wrong. You don't know the truth. And so many times we have it right, but they're trying to change it. It doesn't take a lot for some person to deceive another person. And if it's done the right way, add a little music to it, make it sound harmonious, it works pretty good. The Gospel of Mark. The Gospel of Mark is believed by most theologians to be the first of the Gospels to be written. And although done so by Mark according to early church tradition, probably represents the preaching and the message of the Apostle Peter. So Mark had gotten much of his information directly from Peter. See, we think that the Apostles were always together and everything was done together, and it wasn't. Writing the stories and putting the information together took time. 
And Peter, a great apostle, was able to give a lot of accurate information. He gave it to Mark. Mark puts it down. We have the Gospel of Mark. Mark's Gospel records nothing about the birth of Jesus. <coughs> Mark starts his story of Jesus with the calling of John the Baptist in the wilderness. The first time we see Jesus in the Gospel is when Jesus comes to be baptized by John. The narrative of omission serves as the unique purpose of Mark's Gospel. Mark wrote his Gospel to the Romans of his day and emphasizes the paradoxical message and the hidden service of Jesus as Lord. Together with the secrecy motives in the Gospel, the omission of any details of the birth of Jesus helps the reader to understand that it is not important where a servant is born from or which family he comes from. It is the service that defines him. In each one of these Gospels, we're going to see that the way things are covered by the apostle that covered it, covered it specifically for a reason. If I took four of you, any four, and said, let's go in this room over here and take a look. And when we come back out, I want you to tell me what you saw. Four of you would have many of the facts the same and many of the facts that only you saw. That's how we are. Well, because God knows how we are, we don't stick with... He doesn't give us one story. He gives us each a story of the incident of his son, Jesus Christ, living here on earth for a reason. It approaches each one of us differently. That's why we have specific gospel writers that we choose to enjoy more so than the other one. They're all giving us facts, but sometimes the facts may seem boring, and some of them seem wonderful, so we cling to that one. My favorite writer is John. He's artistic. He's spectacular in my eyes on the way he phrases things. It's beautiful, so that's the one I like to... But the other three Gospels are also important. The Gospel of Matthew. Matthew, in stark contrast to Mark's narrative of omission, begins his account with an elaborate genealogy that places Jesus as a descendant of King David and Abraham. Now keep this in mind from watching The Chosen, you see Matthew. So it was there, jotting things down. We see that because that's who Matthew was. Now, they show Matthew as having a, a little bit of a problem being a regular kind of person. But his accuracy is there from that little kind of a problem. Now, there's nothing saying that he was exactly that way, but the fact is he was into information. Detail, detail, detail. And that sometimes is exactly what we need. The narrative omission begins with the account of an elaborate genealogy that places Jesus as the descendant of the king David and Abraham. Most people hate the genealogies. It's the begot, 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 begot. It seems like, the, why is it even there? Yet it's very important for you to be able to follow time based on those things. Here already, Matthew shows his special interest and the intended audience for his gospel. He is writing to the Jews and presents Jesus as a king, better than David and a teacher greater than Moses. A specific bit of information the Jews were not particularly interested in hearing. Now keep in mind, studying the Old Testament, they were looking for a king to come. They were looking for a savior to come to save them from the Romans. God's intention was to save them from sin, the one thing that could separate them for all eternity. But they were looking for a warrior, someone that could solve their temporary problems. And if you think the Romans were going to last forever, they would probably be fighting against others right now. Oh, that's right, they are. <laughs> Matthew's birth narratives focus on the role of Joseph, who is a just man, in Matthew's words of this event. Joseph is contrasted with Herod, an unjust and wicked ruler. 
There are several men in the New Testament referred to as Herod, four to be exact. The first of the Herods is often known as Herod the Great, and this is the one who sought to kill Jesus in Matthew 2 by slaughtering all the infant boys. This Herod also tried to enlist the wise men to reveal their whereabouts of the baby Jesus. Matthew takes great care to show how the birth event of Jesus fulfills prophecy made in the Old Testament and makes use of the prophecies to present Jesus as a governor, a ruler of Israel, a prince, as God's son. And again, this is not what the Jews wanted. They wanted a warrior. It is Matthew that tells us about the wise men that came to worship, bringing gifts fit for a king, the murderous acts of the bad King Herod recorded the journey of the Holy Family back and forth to Egypt, in no small part to illustrate how Jesus' life mirrors that of the people of Israel, and of the angels who in the dreams directed Joseph. Matthew, in his powerful birth account, presents Jesus in fulfillment of the prophecies and hopes of the Hebrew scriptures as the king of the Jews who has been given all authority in heaven and on earth. He is Emmanuel, God with us. The Gospel of Luke. I'm doing so much reading because I would have forgot half of this trying to tell it to you. Luke's Gospel is an attempt in his own words to put in place an orderly <coughs> account of the birth, ministry, life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. Luke wrote his gospel primarily for a Gentile audience and focuses on traditionally marginalized and neglected groups in the first century Mediterranean societies. Thus, Luke's gospel is full of references to women, children, the sick, the poor, and rejected people groups like the Samaritans. This special and caring focus on the neglected and rejected also featured in Luke's account of the birth of Jesus. Luke's birth narrative is the longest out of all of the four Gospels and gives special attention to the role of the Holy Spirit and to the women in this story. Here the angel appears to Mary, not to Joseph. A lot of people say that's a mistake. It wasn't the angel's... No, if you read both Gospels, it's to two different people. And it is Elizabeth and the later again Mary that each has words of praise and blessing recorded. Luke, in his human focus, records the homeless status of Joseph and Mary in Bethlehem. The special care given to the baby Jesus as he is born and how a lowly feeding trough becomes a crib. As if to further emphasize this consistent focus on the poor and rejected of society, the angels appear to shepherds in Luke's account. Not to the rich, privileged, and powerful wise men in Matthew's account. That means for most of us that were poor, we're in good shape. He likes poor guys. It is the ordinary shepherds that witness this glorious event and become the first messengers of God, peace and goodwill toward men on earth. The beautiful birth narrative of Jesus in Luke's Gospel illustrates the complete kinetic act of God in Jesus. Jesus emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, Philippians 2, 7. Born amongst the poor, rejected, bringing good tidings of peace and goodwill to all. The fact that Jesus is born under poor conditions, and he's announced mostly to poor people at the time, should have told the Jews, you're looking for the wrong thing. You're looking for a warrior to come. It doesn't fit the warrior scenario. But that's what they wanted. And sometimes what we want overshadows what we need. Sometimes we don't realize what we want would not be good for us. We just can't see that. 
especially as we get older, because as we get older, we think we really know a lot. When we were younger and our father or mother said, no, no, well, I'm not giving you that. Are you crazy? There was a reason. And it made sense because we even said to ourselves, yeah, I probably will do something like that. But as we get older, we think we know. And when we ask for something like, I have cancer, Lord, can you stop it? Can you touch me and change what's happening to me? We think we know. But that's not always the case. It's not always what the Lord wants for us at that time. When we lose a child, lose a husband or a wife, when we lose our fortunes, we lose a job, get a pink slip. If you believe in Christ as your Lord and Savior, just watch what's going to happen in the not too distant future. He's directing your life even though you think he's made a mistake. And the Jews, again, as we see the Gospels point out to us that the Jews were always looking for the wrong thing. That's why they missed Jesus. You say to yourself, if you had the book, and you had the scriptures, and your people did nothing but study it, how could you have missed him? There were so many things that pointed directly to him. Miracles that pointed to him. And you still missed him. Because sometimes we're blinded by our own desires. My boy, the Gospel of John. The Gospel of John, the last of the Gospels to be produced, records the birth of Jesus in, heaven, in heavenly, if not spiritual, terms and language. This Gospel, written by the disciple that experienced such love from Jesus that he identifies himself as the one that Jesus loved presents his narrative of the birth of Jesus as a second Genesis account. For John, this birth started in heaven. John 1, 1 and 2. In the beginning, before all time, was the Word, Christ. And the Word was with God, and the Word was God himself. He was continually existing in the beginning, co-eternally with God. He's telling us so much there in that statement, it's unbelievable. First of all, he's telling us he's the person that was missed in the Genesis account. Because in Genesis, you hear about the Father and the Holy Spirit hovering above what was yet to be changed. But we didn't hear about the Son there. So now John tells us all these years later, the Son was present also. As a matter of fact, they were both watching the Son create. Because the Son, Jesus Christ, is the Creator. And it goes on to tell us that He was always God, and that God didn't have a beginning, and neither did He. And why is it possible for God to need <coughs> nothing to exist? Because the one thing that would be needed more than anything else would be love, and there is love within themselves. All three persons of the Holy Trinity are love. They love each other. They are capable of always being. They always were. They always will be. And they're bringing us along with them to the always will be. So Christmas has a huge connotation to our life. We celebrate it. We had a ball yesterday putting the church together and doing things together and eating bagels together. <laughs> but it does have a huge meaning to our lives. So that's why we'll go over all the things that got distorted and we'll see why they actually took place but got distorted. John then describes the birth of Jesus with powerful language. John 1 verse 14, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us. John reaches back. He doesn't take us to the nativity, but he reaches back and tells us what took place. John, writing to the Greek-speaking Gentiles across the Roman Empire, explains that Jesus, the Word, becomes flesh and chooses to dwell with us, and thus we all have been witnesses of his glory, which is full of grace and truth. John's Gospel focuses on the divine attributes of Jesus. John purposefully leaves out any mention of Mary, 
and Joseph and all the other characters that Matthew and Luke mention in the birth narratives. John clearly communicates that this birth is the most significant event in the history of the world. God became flesh and so shining his light in darkness, an event that mirrors in creation the heavens and the earth. Keep this in mind, as great as Christ's death on the cross, which erases everything for those that accept him and receive him, his resurrection, which proves that we're now covered, could not have taken place without a birth. So this birth is most likely the greatest event that will ever take place here on this planet. In summary, the four Gospels in the New Testament present four unique and yet complementary pictures of Jesus, and that's all that matters. And this is the event in the way they recorded the birth of Jesus. Matthew told us he presents Jesus as the king of the Jews, worthy of obedience and worship. Luke shows a humane savior that brings good tidings and liberation to the poor, neglected and marginalized. Mark presents Jesus as the Lord that serves in the secret and shows a new way free from the fight of supremacy and status. And finally, John presents Jesus as the God who comes as the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we say we saw his glory, glory as belongs to the one and only begotten Son of the Father, the Son who is truly unique, the only one of his kind, who is full of grace and truth. And he shines in the world in the darkness to bring a new beginning to this world. He is the only one, including the Godhead, that was fully man and fully God and never giving up those parts. We will see him for all eternity as fully man and fully God. Let's close in prayer. Holy Father, I hope everyone looks forward to hearing about the things that got a little distorted along the way, but that's what we do. We sometimes forget something like when we catch a fish and all of a sudden the size keeps getting bigger. <laughs> And by the time the story comes back to us, we didn't catch a fish, we caught a whale. That's us, who you created. In your image and likeness, we are in trouble all the time because of the ways we are. But we look forward to this season where we bless, we love to hear about, and we love to celebrate the birth of Christ, who without him, we would have nothing. And with him, we have everything. We thank you through the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 Yes, yes. The lighting of the Advent candles. Advent calls us to prepare our hearts for the coming of Christ. All around us, people prepare for parties, dinners, and presents. These events could distract us from the real reason for our anticipation. On the other hand, they could prepare us. They could be the voice in the wilderness of materialism. Prepare the way for the coming of what is really important. Rather than get lost in the wilderness of distraction, we will listen to the voice that is calling our name. We will listen for the word in the words we choose to be a peaceful presence in the midst of a frantic mm -hmm. season so today we will light the first and second advent candles as an act of preparation and call it peace the first one's going to be a reach for us it's on the left See the number? There you go. You get that one and let plug it. There you got it. This is one. That's okay. She can reach it easier that way. She so don't have to get up. Wow. 
God loves you too. He's letting that candle <laughs> lighter you. work well. <laughs> I hope so. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. <laughs> saying, take it, this is my body. <coughs> then he took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, and they all drank from it. This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many, he said to them. Truly, I tell you, I will not drink again from the fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it anew in the kingdom of God.
speak. Colossians 3, 16. Let the spoken word of Christ have its home within you, dwelling in your heart and mind, permitting every aspect of you, your believing as you teach spiritual things and admonish and train one another with all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your hearts to God. Amen. Once again, Father. <laughs> Thank you. 